This is Offensive Jaw 3 by Max Harley. I'm an associate consultant at Spectrops and formerly a student of Clemson University and ex-president of Clemson Security Club, CU Cyber. My goal for this talk is to show red teamers how they can improve their tradecraft by using the blue team technique known as Jaw 3, both in their HTTPS communication channels, think security tools and implants, and to use Jaw 3 to protect their payloads. I want to give a big shout out to Lee Christensen, who first introduced me to Jaw3 and gave me the idea for payload keying using this technique, as well as all of his contributions to Satellite. Second, I want to shout out Matt Rinaldi, the current president of CU Cyber and binary exploitation champion, for co-writing the Jaw3 transport project. A big thanks to John B. Althaus, Jeff Atkinson, Josh Atkins, the three JAs who developed Jaw3. And finally, the refraction.networking project for making Matt and my job easy when developing JAW3 transport. This project, as the title implies, is based on JAW3, which is the research of three folks at Salesforce. JAW3 was originally designed as a way for blue teamers to profile SSL TLS clients hitting their network. Here and for the rest of this talk, when I say client, I mean either a browser or HTTP library like Go's net HTTP or Python's requests. So what is JAW3? To answer this, we need to know a bit about TLS. The beautiful thing about TLS is that the encryption is not concrete. If a client and server both implement a new cipher suite, they can start communicating using the new encryption mechanism as long as both parties implement it. As a result, before TLS communication begins, the client and server need to negotiate the encryption mechanism they're gonna use. The client begins this process by sending a client hello packet. I opened up Wireshark and captured a TLS handshake. As you can see, this is the client hello packet, which is attempting to negotiate the encryption mechanism both client and server will use. The client wants to implement TLS 1.2, and it implements two cipher suites as shown here. The server then responds with a server hello packet. You can see it confirms TLS version 1.2 and uses the cipher suite OXC030. If we go back to the client hello packet, we can see that the cipher suite OXC030 was one of the cipher suites that the client advertised. The genius that the folks at Salesforce had was recognizing that client libraries typically use the same client hello parameters. If enough client hello packet and client library pairs are gathered, a blue teamer can figure out what type of client is communicating with the server just using the client hello packet. The parameters JAW3 uses for its signature are the SSL version, the cipher, the SSL extension, elliptic curve, and elliptic curve point formats. When there are multiple values, a hyphen is put in between them and the commas separate the fields. This is an example of a JAW3 string. If you take the MD5 hash of that string, you get the JAW3 signature. You can think of JAW3 like a better user agent string, since it identifies the type of client being used and is very difficult to set because it's built into these client HTTP libraries. This is a toy example of how JAW3 works as a detection mechanism. If the parameters discussed before were 1, 2, and 3, we could find the user agent that matches those parameters and be fairly sure that the real type of client is Metasploit. And the same for the next two using different user agents with different client libraries. In this case, 2, 3, and 4 match to Chrome version 68, and 6, 5, and 4 match to Safari version 601. In the last example, we see that a client is attempting to hit our network using the same client hello parameters as Metasploit, but it's advertising as the Safari version 601 user agent. In this case, we can be suspicious of this traffic since we know that the Safari version 601 user agent is different and the client hello parameters match Metasploit. Another example use case of JAW3 that I really like, which relates more to quality of service instead of security, is finding the JAW3 signature of the Python requests library to find all instances of users attempting to programmatically snipe items from an online store. since. Most sniping software is made with Python. Now we'll talk about the JAW3 transport project. It may be an obvious question, but it's important to ask, why would you want to spoof a JAW3 signature? 
Well, it's the same answer as to why you'd want to change the user agent string. It can identify clients. If you can change the client hello packet, then blue teamers using JAW3 as a detection mechanism wouldn't be confident in that value for detection purposes. So this would be a huge win for the red teams. So that's where JAW3 transport comes in. JAW3 transport was actually the second JAW3 project I worked on chronologically, but the easiest project to understand. So I thought I'd talk about it first. Last semester, my teammate in the Clemson Security Club, Matt Rinaldi and I, were trying to come up with fun side projects. I had done some research on JAW3 already with Satellite, the project I'm gonna show next, and I really wanted to do more work with JAW3. So the project we came up with was to create a library that made spoofing JAW3 signatures as easy as changing the user agent string. That was our goal. At the end of the day, we figured that those values were sent by the client, so spoofing them should at least be possible. We ended up choosing Go because both Matt and I were very familiar with the language and a bit familiar with the implementation details of the standard library. On the engineering side, our first thought was how could one change the client hello packet in Go's standard library without having to rewrite an entirely new HTTP library? Because that's not something we wanted to take on. After digging into the source, we figured out that Go exposes their implementation of a round tripper called the HTTP transport object. So our goal was to create a transport object that could create custom JAW3 signatures. Using a transport object is actually very easy. First, you create the transport object. Then you create a new HTTP client that uses that transport. And then once that client is created, you can do normal HTTP gets, posts, anything you'd like with that client. Luckily, we discovered a library called UTLS written by refraction.network which is an organization dedicated to circumventing censorship. It provided us a way to use custom parameters in the client hello packet, and it would actually return a transport object. The only problem we saw with the library was that it was fairly difficult to use since it provided so many options. We really just wanted an interface for creating JAW3 signatures. So we wrote a wrapper library that allows users to simply type in a JAW3 string and it would configure an HTTP transport object for you. We tried to make this as easy to use as possible. All you need to do is call new transport and supply a JAW3 string. The library will then create a UTLS HTTP transport object that you can now supply to the transport argument in HTTP client. Now use this client like you would any other Golang HTTP client and you'll have a replicated JAW3 signature. This is an example of using the JAW3 transport project in practice. On line 11, we're selecting Safari as the browser we'd like to imitate. On line 14, we're creating the HTTP client object using the wrapper function new. On line 15, we're making a request to jaw3er.com, which is a helpful tool that finds the JAW3 signature of an HTTP request sent to it. Jaw3er.com will return to us the user agent it believes the request we're making us. When we run this Go file, we can see that Jaw3er will return to us the user agent Safari that it believes that we actually are, when in fact we're using the Go standard library. The downside to this library is that UTLS still uses Golang's crypto TLS for their extensions. So you're limited to the TLS extensions that are implemented by crypto TLS. But that's okay, since the subset implemented can successfully spoof versions of Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. We do throw an error if a user attempts to create a transport object with values that are not supported by crypto TLS. In this example, we want to implement extensions 13, 21, 28, and 46. So the problem is that crypto TLS only implements 13, 21, and 28. Therefore, if we have a JAW3 string that supplies these arguments as extensions, we won't be able to create a JAW3 transport object that implements it. To sum up, JAW3 transport allows attackers to spoof JAW3 signatures and trick defenders into thinking traffic is good when it actually is malicious. The next project I want to talk about is Satellite. I'm not going to discuss a whole lot about usage, but focus mostly on JAW3, given the title of the talk. Satellite is a payload hosting web server similar to Apache with Mod Rewrite or Caddy, but it's much easier to configure and has a lot more features, including JAW3 support. 
Another way of putting this is that it's a web server that allows you to perform payload keying with little headache. If you've never heard of payload keying, it's a simple concept. Basically, an attacker wants a payload only to open on their target and not open when a member of the IR team or sandbox tool opens it. For example, the attacker may know that the target's host name is Selden. When the payload is executed, the program checks if the target's host is Selden. If it isn't, then it returns exit success, but if it matches, then it executes the real payload. Normally, the term payload keying is discussed in relation to the payloads themselves, but the same concept can be used for downloading payloads. This isn't a new concept, and I'm sure many people watching have had to do this to bypass certain online mail sandboxes. One common way to key payload network traffic is to whitelist user agents and IPs that are used by that organization after some reconnaissance. Using satellite, you can do IP and user agent block listing with ease. In the var www HTML directory, payload.exe is the file you want to send to the user. To add keying rules to the payload, you can create a text file with .info appended to it. In this case, it's payload.exe.info. In this example, we found that the target was using a user agent that ties back to an Android phone, and we're sending them a payload for Android. We also found that their internal mail filter is on IP address 123.123.123.123, so we can blacklist that IP from accessing the payload. We also found that their internet mail filter is running on the subnet 40.41.42.1/24. This way, we can ensure that our payload is only being accessed by the user we're trying to target and not the mail filters we want to block from. And that's how you use satellite. You use it like any other web server by placing payloads into the server root, then add .info files to your routes and payload keying is done. And just like with other web servers that allow some form of keying, mod rewrite or caddy, you can specify what happens to a client who requests a path but doesn't conform to the key you set. This is done in satellite with the on failure keyword. In the case on the left, we're authorizing the Mozilla user agent, anything that contains Mozilla. And if the user agent doesn't conform to that, then we'll redirect them using a 301 to google.com. On the right-hand side, instead of redirecting, we're going to render a page locally, 404. This way, when an IR person who isn't using Mozilla tries to access the page, they won't be able to recognize that a payload is being downloaded and instead see a 404 page. There are also many other satellite options, including serve, which allows a payload to be served n number of times. There's authorized or blacklist user agents, uh, same with IP range, uh, you can blacklist headers, uh, and then using the MaxMind database for IP addresses, you can authorize or blacklist countries. Finally, you can do credential capture with ease and specify proxies if you want to do team server redirection. Another great feature of satellite is global conditionals. If you have a set of conditions that your team always wants to constrain on, you can create conditional files in the Etsy satellite conditions directory. These rules will be applied to all routes in the server root. In this example, we're blacklisting two IPs from a known email filtering service, and also blacklisting two of Google's automated scanner user agents. The great thing about this is that they're managed in two separate files that may be downloaded from GitHub, and therefore managed by different people without getting in the way of each other. This would be extremely useful if integrated with 0x ZDH's redirect.rules repository. Currently, redirect.rules dynamically generates Apache mod rewrite rules to di direct traffic away from known sandbox environments. If you make your global conditionals well enough, you'll never have to reconfigure them, and the rules can easily be dropped into any new infrastructure you stand up. Finally, and most importantly, is authorizing and blacklisting JAW3 signatures. There's a very cool emergent technique that appears when you can control the value of a JAW3 signature using JAW3 transport, and when JAW3 values can be keyed using satellite. 
Think about a multi-stage payload like Dwight Hanstein discusses in his dynamic module loading and go series of blog posts. You have a loader and stages that contain logic for performing different tasks like downloading files or running shell commands. You can protect these stages by making your loader use a specific JAW3 signature and only allowing that JAW3 signature to access your second or third stage. That way, defenders would only be able to pull the loader and be unable to access the later stages of your payload unless they can replicate the JAW3 signature that you provide. This makes blue teamers jump through many more hoops if they want to reverse engineer your payload. In the same vein, you can key proxy traffic so that it's much more difficult for blue teamers to discover your C2 infrastructure. This project is packaged as a .deb and .rpm file as well as source in the releases page, so it should be very easy to install on most machines. Check out the blog post linked in the readme page. It has a video where I install and use the project on a Debian machine to get you started. If you want more examples, check out the examples folder on GitHub. There are more options that I couldn't get to in this video that are well worth checking out. There are a ton more features to add to Satellite. Just, just look at how many GitHub issues there are. Here are a few examples of features I'm excited about. First, there's some heavy work that needs to be done on this project. It was originally a simple proof of concept, but more features kept being added instead of rewriting the core. The crypto TLS and net HTTP libraries are altered in order to capture the TLS extensions used. So before any new features are added, I need to fork the Go language to add those features in to use normal libraries that use net HTTP and crypto TLS. I'd like to make Satellite a robust proxying service that surpasses other proxying services out there. Uh, the first step to this would be to integrate JAW3 transport into Satellite and allow the outgoing proxy signature to match any JAW3 signature input from the user. Next, and this is more of a quality of life update for anyone who's had to set up a redirector, is to add URI globbing to proxy paths. Next would be uh, HTML smuggling. Uh, I think you can make HTML smuggling easier by allowing the attacker to specify an HTML template and payload separately, and then automatically combine them into an HTML smuggling page. Again, this is more of a quality of life update since you can already serve smuggling payloads. Uh, I just think this feature would be really cool. And it's actually one that Lee Christensen recommended. So a huge shout out to him. Finally, would be to add authentication on the payload. So a user must type in a password in order to access the payload. Um, this is very useful for phishing. Uh, it's another technique that can sometimes help attackers bypass sandbox or IR services. In conclusion, JAW3 is a technique that can be used offensively as well as defensively. Attackers should think about the JAW3 fingerprints they're leaving behind when performing attacks and use tooling to change those fingerprints to avoid detection. Using JAW3, we can also protect our payloads and proxy traffic. So I have three call to actions. First, JAW3 transport is a Go library. This work should be done for all languages that Red Team tools are developed in. The second is that if you're writing Red Team tools in Go, Try implementing JAW3 transport in your project. The only thing I can say about Satellite is to please use it and let me know if there's any issues or ideas you have with the project. It's the only way I can make it better. I hope you learned something from this presentation and enjoy the rest of SOCON.